Hey, good morning. Welcome to episode number 29 of our study of the book of Acts, our daily devotional and study of the Word of God series that we have been going through. Uh, if you remember from yesterday's devotion uh, or yesterday's or the previous day's uh, message that we had, uh, we saw the ministry of Paul and Barnabas, and they were being persecuted uh, in the locations in which they were. They had come to uh, Antioch. They had come to Iconium. They came to Lystra. Uh, they were seeing people come to uh, a saving knowledge of Jesus in those communities. In Lystra, they had a different problem because in Lystra, they saw Paul and Barnabas as gods or godlike, uh, and they wanted to sacrifice and worship them as gods, which caused them to feel like they were blaspheming God by even allowing that to happen. So Paul and Barnabas tore their clothes. They demonstrated the fact that, no, we're just we're just people like you. We're just uh, humans like you, men like you. Uh, don't worship us. There's only one you will worship, and that is God. Um, so in the meantime, persecution continued to follow Paul and Barnabas everywhere that they went, because every time they began to preach the word of God, Satan would stand in opposition. One of the groups that he used in opposition was the Jewish group who wanted to uh, wanted to persecute Paul and Barnabas. They did not believe that Jesus was the Messiah. Uh, they wanted to to really quench anything that was happening. Now, ultimately, they couldn't do that. But in this case, as we wrap up chapter 14 today, we're going to see that persecution continued to follow Paul everywhere that he went. So let's look at this together and uh, get into our devotional today. It says, then Jews from Antioch, now that's where he had been previously, then he went to Iconium, then he went to Lystra, but the Jews from Antioch followed him. They went to Iconium, they got those Jews, they followed Paul uh, to Lystra where he was at. Then they persuaded the multitudes, in other words, they stirred up the multitudes, they 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 really... Um, they uh, poisoned the minds of the multitude. They got the multitude to be bitter and they acted like the crowd and the crowd. And you could just see that in our society today when they get stirred up with the wrong ideas, when they get stirred up with a lie and they begin to believe a lie, it creates this havoc. They begin to have mob mentality. And in this particular case, they stoned Paul and they dragged him out of the city, supposing him to be dead. Now, stoning in that day could have been picking up a stone and throwing it at him. It could have been throwing him over the side of a, of a small little drop off or cliff or hill, standing above him and dropping large boulders on him. It was, it was stoning him, trying to kill him through the use of stones in some manner. Uh, what a painful way. Uh, to die or what a painful experience to have to go through. Uh, they they stoned Paul. They dragged him out of the city. They thought he was dead. So Paul had to have been so out of it that he seemed to be dead, unable to recover from the injuries that he had sustained. Internal injuries, head injuries, maybe he was not breathing. Maybe his, maybe his pulse was gone. His heart was stopped. I don't know. They thought he was dead. However, when the disciples gathered around him, he rose up and he went into the city. So in my view, that's just another miracle that happened. They thought he was dead. In other words, he had no pulse. He was not breathing. He had sustained massive amounts of energy, in, uh, injuries. But when the disciples gathered around him, God did a miracle. He rose up and went into the city. Now, even, even him, just the ability to stand up after having that kind of trauma, you know, think of that. If something like that happened today, people would be in the hospital for weeks and weeks, recovering, trying to get better, trying to get strength back. Um, if people had gone through a car uh, wreck or they had gone through some massive injury at work, they're going to be knocked out of it for for you know, days, weeks, months, maybe even years, who, who knows how long. Paul, the injuries he would have sustained, the, the damage to his body, yet they gathered around him, he rose up, and he walked into the city. What an amazing event that would be. This is just a dramatic demonstration. By the way, it's a dramatic demonstration of how fickle the crowd can be, too. They admired Paul. They revered Paul. They wanted to, they wanted to sacrifice to Paul. And then with the Jews stirring them up, now they've turned on him completely, and now they want him dead, and they want him killed. Um, that's kind of the way that the crowd can work. You know, Paul will refer to these kind of things later. 
Galatians 6.17, Paul's going to write, I bear in my body the marks of Jesus. Uh, in 2 Corinthians 11, he's going to talk about all of the events that happened, how he had been persecuted, uh, how how his body had suffered, how he had been, uh, he had gone through beatings and whippings and being shipwrecked and being stoned. All of these things are things that happened to Paul as he went forward with the gospel. So now Paul after he walks into Lystra, is going to uh, leave the city of Lystra for the city of Derby, where they're going to find more evangelistic success. So let's look at this together. And the next day, Paul departed with Barnabas to Derby. Now, again, think of it. He, he got up and he walked into the city. Now he's going to get up and he's going to walk into Derby. Uh, just the ability to walk from city to city after going through such such an event and such drama, uh, drama. What an amazing thing! Uh, having to go through that kind of that kind of intense persecution, and yet being able to walk from city to city. It just shows the miraculous work of God. That God was empowering him to do the work of the ministry. That this was not based upon Paul's ability, Paul's strength, Paul's uh, Paul's. Uh, uh, perseverance and wording. It's all God's empowerment in him as he goes through all of these things in life. So the next day they departed to Derby, and when they had preached the gospel to that city, the uh, and they had made many disciples, so they had its success. They had incredible work. They were preaching the gospel. They were making disciples just in a different place. Then they returned back to Lystra and to Iconium and to Antioch. Now think of that. Those are the three places that he was persecuted. He went right back to them. What a, what a crazy thing to do, to go right back to the cities that persecuted you, unless you had an incredible love for them, you didn't fear for your own life, and you were more concerned with what God's plan was what, rather than what your plan was. They returned right back to the places that they were being persecuted, and they were strengthening the souls of the disciples, exhorting them to continue in the faith and saying, we must, through many tribulations, enter the kingdom of God. Notice those words. We must, through many tribulations, enter the kingdom of God. The early disciples expected and anticipated tribulation, trials, persecution, hard times, suffering. They anticipated it. They expected it. They were prepared for it. And in fact, they rejoiced when those things actually happened. That message runs so counter to our culture today, and it runs so counter to preaching that is given from some of the mega churches today. Not all churches are bad. Not all pastors are bad. Not all mega churches are bad. But this message is one that is so, uh, so misunderstood and so often failed to be preached. We must, through many tribulations, enter the kingdom of God. Wrap your brain around that statement. Prepare yourself for the suffering that may happen through life as we enter into the kingdom of God. Be prepared that we must go through many tribulations. Believers in China, believers in Africa, believers in India, believers in Iran, Iraq, Afghanistan, Syria, believers in Turkey, believers in Lebanon, they know this verse and they believe this verse and they have experienced this verse. In fact, today, as I share this message, there are believers around the world that are experiencing tribulation today because of their belief in Jesus. Through many tribulations, we will enter the kingdom of God. The church in America is unprepared for this statement. And as hard times come our way, as we approach what I firmly believe is the end of all things that Jesus himself spoke about, we have to be prepared to enter into the kingdom of God through many tribulations. 
not loving our lives even unto death, prepared for whatever comes our way, that we will not deny, turn our backs, or disregard Jesus who gave his life for us. What about you? Can you with certainty say, I understand that through many tribulations, I'm going to enter the kingdom of God. In our culture, we preach an easy kind of gospel. The kind of gospel that says, you won't suffer. You won't go through hard times. God is going to make you healthy, wealthy, and wise. I don't believe any of the disciples or any of those in the book of Acts would ever believe that kind of a preaching statement. In fact, they would say that's outright false. God has never promised any of that. What he has promised is that we will go through many tribulations as we enter, <coughs> excuse me, as we enter the kingdom of God. Well, they go on to say this. So when Paul and Barnabas had appointed elders in every church, in other words, they got churches up and running. They had pastors, elders, leaders, teachers, shepherds in every church, and they prayed for these leaders and they prayed for these churches with fasting. They commended them to the Lord. So in other words, they ordained them, they committed them to the Lord, they prayed, they fasted, and they commended them to the Lord in whom they believed. That was the work that they were doing. They were going around from every city to build the church, to grow the church, to make disciples, to appoint elders, to appoint teachers, leaders, shepherds, in order to protect the sheep. And when they had done so, they moved on to the next city and they did it with prayer and fasting because they wanted the health of these churches. And so they committed them to the Lord. And when they had passed through uh, Poseidia, they came to Pamphylia. Now, when they had preached the word in Perga, they went down to Italia, and from there they sailed to Antioch, again, where they had started, when they had been committed to the grace of God for the work which they had completed. And it says, um, now when they had come together and they gathered the church together, the church in Antioch. Now remember, Antioch was the sending church. It was the home church. It was the base. It was the church that Paul and Barnabas went out from. When they had completed their first missionary journey, they came back. They reported to the church. When they gathered the church together, they reported all the things that God had done. What a what an in, a, amazing adventure. What a story of, of miraculous salvations. What a story of the miracles that were accomplished during our journey. What an incredible story they had, not only stories of the highs, but of the lows, not only of the good times, but of the persecutions. They shared all of these stories and how God had opened the door of faith to the Gentiles. So they stayed a long time in Antioch with the disciples preparing for the next journey that they were on. They followed God's leading. They listened to God's voice. They saw the miraculous happen. They saw people come to faith. They appointed elders. They went through times of persecution and suffering almost to the point of death, but they realized that their lives were not their own. They had been bought with a price. They had taken up their crosses and followed Jesus. They did not love their lives even to the point of death. And they were prepared that through many tribulations, they would enter the kingdom of heaven. And one day when they were at that point of entering the kingdom of heaven, they would hear the words of Jesus himself saying, well done, my good and faithful servant. I hope that's your same heart as well. The furtherance of the gospel, the furtherance of the kingdom of God, sharing with those around you, not caring what anybody else may think, not loving your life even to death, never being willing to turn your back on Jesus, but always proclaiming him who saved you by his grace. And that you will understand that one day he will look at you and say, well done, my good and faithful servant. Well, that's all I have for you today. That closes out chapter 14. In our next devotional, we'll pick it up right there in chapter 15, verse 1. 
and that will be episode 30. Join me back here at that time. In the meantime, I hope you have a godly and blessed day and that you walk in his grace. I'll see you next time.